to access. Okay, got it. Um, I think we, and maybe I'm I'm wrong, um, Anna, I don't know, did, I thought we called all of the Spanish, the, the folks that needed Spanish ahead of this meeting, but, and maybe we thought there was connection, but it sounds like maybe they don't have the connection we thought they would have for the meeting. Is that maybe what's happening? And I don't know if you know, or I don't know if Zong is on. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm checking with Jacinia and um, Mari to see if. Um, but yeah, we could certainly set that up and get those folks. We did announce that we, I know we did an outreach and at the time came to the conclusion that we didn't need it. We reached out to anyone who's used the AT&T line in the past. Um, anytime recently in the past six months. And then that's sort of what we used to craft the message we sent out um, when we sent out the, the email last week. Um, but we're certainly happy to, to set it up again and get yeah. the number out to folks. It's no big deal. Yeah, Justinia called them on Friday and confirmed this. That they, that they, that they had they the would. ability. Yeah. Just so everyone kind of catch up while everyone's um, getting called in or logging on right now. So the thought was, and maybe just a little bit of background. So the AT&T call line is a, is a way to access um, that we've provided kind of in addition to Zoom to access the meeting to get the full Spanish translation. Uh, one of the things though, is that as you all know, when a Spanish speaker has a comment, we've had to pause and wait for translation. and. In other public meetings, folks have been pretty successful, even using the interpreters we use, to have simultaneous translation. So that way, when someone in the Spanish channel has a comment, they don't have to pause and wait, and they get their full comment translated in real time. Unfortunately, that doesn't work if you use the call-in line. Um, so we called all of the folks and tried to make sure that everyone could log in via Zoom, which is how everyone's been logging in the past several meetings. Um, so that we could try a simultaneous translation tonight as sort of our, our first try at it. So that was what we did when we called last week. Um, and so I'll just confirm with the team if that's not the case, we can certainly have the line back up um, and have folks call in through their phones. Yes, we did have a we did have some changes happening. Usually I'm, I'm in person with with the chapter ladies. But um, because of COVID, I'm not able to join with them. And um, that's why I send um, the call-in information for them to, to join in um, via phone, not in person. But um, as I mentioned, it wasn't something that we wanted to do. An over like, it was an overnight thing that we, we had to change uh, mm. our, our, the way that we have our meeting. No problem. So can I, Bianca, are you, do you know who, do we need to, we can make a quick phone call and get those folks set back up. Is that something we need to, um, that you know those exact who we need to reach out to? We can make help with that right now. It's, um, it's uh, Minerva Hernandez, Socorro Guzman, and Felipa Trujillo. I see there's a hand raised from Ana Valle. Go ahead, Anna, if you would like to share. And you're currently muted, Anna, but we see you all waving. Oh, it looks like some of the ladies are there with her. Oh, they don't have mic. Uh, something. I think someone said there's no mic or video, but they can hear everyone. Anna Valle, gusta decir un comentario o gusta decir algo? Puede quitarse el modo silencio. I'm wondering if the hand is raised by accident. Um, I just want to confirm, so maybe I'll turn to the Air District to confirm how we want to proceed with setting up translation so that we can share the appropriate instructions for the evening. Um, are we still doing tr simultaneous translation or is there a need to open up the AT&T line? We will, so I see there are a couple. I see Felipa in Yeah, I see screen. Felipa and it looks like two other, it's hard to tell because there's the background, but a couple people with Felipa and a couple people with Ana Valle. So I'm wondering if those are all of the folks that we thought when we called last week and confirmed maybe everyone is on, but I do want to make sure they're all connected. 
So what if we, can we share the instructions on how to connect? Absolutely. And then, um, and then in the, that way we can get everyone in the proper channels. And then in the meantime, I don't know, Bianca, if you can see video, but if you feel like everyone, and maybe we on our end can double check, if we think everyone we see on video is who we were waiting for, maybe we can proceed. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave space. Um, maybe just for that a moment right now, just for Spanish to get Spanish speakers in the proper channel. If it looks like it's working and we're good to go, then we can proceed with the English speakers and, and try to do the simultaneous if that works for everyone. I actually got a, a message from, from Ana Valle, is Ana Mar uh, Maribel Valle. Um, if you could, if somebody from interpretation could give them step-by-step -step how to get logging into the Spanish interpretation, we would really appreciate it right now. Perfect, yep, I'll leave space Absolutely. for that and go ahead. I'll hand it over to Linguistica for instructions in Spanish. Hola, buenas tardes a todos, todos los que necesitan ayuda para poder ingresar a el canal de interpretación en español. Para poder hacer eso, si usted está por computadora, va a buscar un icono de un mundo que debería de estar abajo de su pantalla. Se ve como un mundo, lo seleccionarán. Luego seleccionarán donde dice español y lo invitamos a poner en modo silencio el audio original. De esa manera no esté escuchando dos voces a la misma vez. Si usted está por tableta o por teléfono, el proceso es un poquito diferente. Va a seleccionar donde hay tres puntitos que dicen more o en inglés que significa más. Luego va a seleccionar interpretación, so language interpretation si lo tienen en inglés o solamente interpretación. Luego van a seleccionar español. Una vez más los invito a poner en modo silencio el audio original. Y cuando usted acabe, aparecerá arriba de su pantalla donde dice listo o si está en inglés dirá done. Seleccione ahí y ya debería de estar escuchando la voz de mi compañera Tanya si hizo los pasos correctamente. Y pues si quieren lo podemos repetir una vez más, un poquito más despacio para que de esa manera lo puedan hacer conmigo. Entonces una vez más, si usted está por computadora, va a buscar en su pantalla el icono de un mundo. Como lo pueden ver ahí en su pantalla, está, tienen las flechitas y ahí está el mundo que dice interpretation o en español interpretación. Luego seleccionarán donde dice español y, y tiene un globito que dice ES al lado. Luego también va a poner en modo silencio el audio original que aparece abajito de ahí. Y así debería de estar en el canal de español. Pero si usted está por tableta o por teléfono, una vez más, el proceso es diferente. Seleccionará los tres puntitos que significa más. Luego van a seleccionar donde dice language interpretation en inglés o si está en español interpretación. Luego seleccionarán español, una vez más poner en modo silencio el audio original y arriba de su pantalla saldrá donde diga listo o done. Ahí va a seleccionar eso, ya debería de estar en el canal de español escuchando a mi compañera Tanya y ya no debería de estar escuchando mi voz. Déjenos saber si tienen alguna pregunta o si gusta que repitamos esas mismas instrucciones una vez más. Perfect. Thank you. So I think, yeah, I think we're good to go. Thank you so much, um, everybody, for your patience as we're, um, as Jess was uh, sharing with everybody. Um, well, first of all, good evening. Um, my name is Gabby Magaña. Um, you may usually see me in the background here of the chapter meetings. I usually support with uh, um, action items and attendance, but today I will be facilitating the session. Um, my colleague Jessica is out for the day. Um, so it's great to be here leading this conversation with you all. As Jess was sharing, um, we are using simultaneous translation moving forward, which will allow us to hear the comments from our Spanish um, CSC members at the same time that they're being shared, which allows for more equitable sharing across the board. And so as a result of this new change, um, everybody will actually have to join a translation channel. So I'm going to walk you through the same instructions that our interpreters just shared in Spanish, but in English. So if you are an English speaker, you actually have to join um, an interpretation channel in order to be able to hear all of the comments during today's meeting. 
So in order to do that, um, I want you to navigate to the bottom of your screen if you're joining through a desktop and you should see what looks like a world icon. Um, from there, you want to select the language English. And then you also want to select mute original audio, which will allow you to only hear comments in English and that way you don't hear both languages at the same time. And then similarly, if you're joining by phone um, or a tablet, you can navigate to the bottom of your screen where you see three little dots that say more. Click on those dots, select language interpretation once more, select the English channel again, and then select mute original audio. Um, I'm gonna give people like one to two minutes to get that started and I'll repeat the instructions just one more time for everybody. So. No matter what language you speak, you have to select a channel. In order to select the English channel, click on the world icon at the bottom of your screen, select your preferred language, and select mute original audio so that you're only listening to one language at a time. It's important that you join a channel because um, if you do not, we won't be able to hear any comments that you're sharing with us today, and then you won't be able to hear any of the interpretation that we're hearing um, from the, our uh, colleagues here at Linguistica Interpreting. So does anybody have any questions about um, joining the interpretation? Okay, perfect. So with that, I'm gonna actually get started with um, some of our regular housekeeping um, um, slides. So we, as a reminder, uh, this is your 39th CSC meeting and um, we want to make sure that everybody please renames themselves to join this meeting. So if you are affiliated with the CSC, make sure that you're indicating that by um, writing out CSC at the beginning of your name. If you're a resident, use the letter R. If you are a member of the Air District or CARB, you can also indicate that. Um, if you're a member of the general public, using the letter P. And then if you have any other organizational affiliation, um, use uh, uh, you can write down your organizational name. Um, just as a reminder for everybody, please stay on mute unless you are currently speaking. This allows there to be less audio feedback for everybody and um, creates a smoother meeting process. Um, if you happen to be joining by phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute. And then similarly, if you wish to share something with us, please do so by raising your hand or indicating it in a comment somehow. If you are using the raise your hand feature and you happen to be calling in, you can raise your hand by using star nine and then um, unraise it by also clicking star nine. Also a reminder that residents of the stipend program should stay for at least 75% of the meeting to be eligible for a stipend. I'm gonna go ahead and skip past this since we just talked about it. And then a quick reminder about some of the ground rules that we've all agreed on for these conversations. So I'll briefly um, walk through some of these, but uh, let's focus on solutions and opportunities for productive dialogue to help achieve some of the meeting goals. Um, really let everybody participate, um, be civil and respectful during this conversation, um, stay on point and on time, which means that sometimes for time's sake, I might have to move you along or, you know, move forward to another agenda item. Um, if you have a disagreement with somebody, focus on the differences between the problem and not so much the differences that you may have with the person. So let's be as respectful as we can be about different ideas. And then seeking common ground. So um, building consensus really helps us achieve um, the best results. So let's always try to focus on that. And I'm also going to um, just pause for a minute or two um, so that um, any CSC members joining who speak Spanish are able to take a look at some of these rules as well. And then um, finally, I'm just gonna do a brief overview of today's agenda. So we're doing a quick welcome and you know, going over some of these logistics, including some of our new translation um, procedures. Um, and then at 510 or just in a couple minutes, we will do a cargo sustainability study presentation. Um, and then we will also get a project update from the San Joaquin Valley interdisciplinary research team. 
Um, at 540, we'll uh, have a discussion about the SERP measure prioritization. And then at 635, we'll have some of our standing updates. And then as always, we'll wrap up with the next steps and public comment. So with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Jessica Olson for some welcoming remarks. I will be brief. Thank you all so much. And thank you all for um, being patient with us as we transition to this new, hopefully more equitable translation procedure and process. So we'll definitely get work the kinks out and it might be sort of one of those reminders we have to at the beginning of every meeting and as new people hop on, remind people to get in a channel no matter what. That's just sort of your mantra now. Um, we also, um, I just want to mention that um, the study that we'll be presenting um, just really briefly here from our friends over at Kern Cog, it's more of a little bit preview before a presentation we hope to have in February. So I don't want Rob to freak out and think, wait a minute, this was in the agreement. So yes, it's a little bit of a preview, a little bit of, um, <laughs> yeah, a little bit of um, um, just sort of a, a touch base um, in hopes that we can present um, something a little more comprehensive at the next meeting. Otherwise, we welcome all of the presenters for today and thank you all for your participation and I'll pass it back to Gabby. Thanks, Jess. Um, before I start with the first agenda item, I just wanna remind everyone that we're always looking for community co-hosts. Um, and so if you're ever interested in supporting a future CSC meeting, please feel free to let us know via the chat in these meetings or um, at a future agenda setting meeting as well. Um, with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Rob Ball um, for the cargo sustainability update. Hi, and thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to uh, bring this important work uh, uh, to you. Uh, uh, your uh, plan has something called HD9, which is the heavy duty truck rerouting. And KernCog, while the AB617 process was underway, oh, and I want to recognize uh, also um, Linda Urata, uh, who has uh, been participating in the uh, uh, steering committee meetings and, and monitoring it on behalf of uh, KernCog. Uh, KernCog has been doing a, a parallel project called the Cargo Study or the Kern Area Regional Goods Movement Operations Sustainability Study. And it's a study that's focused on, uh, we're seeing a, a big influx in trucking and trucking related uh, activities and uh, those have some impacts on all of our communities. And so next uh, meeting, uh, next month, uh, we're going to bring you a presentation, an overview of what that um, uh, cargo sustainability study is dealing with, and specifically some of the ones that meet your HD9 um, uh, uh, plan uh, strategy. Uh, if you'll notice that uh, the implementation agency on that is the city of Shaft, or is the city and the county and, and Caltrans. And we have all three of those organizations represented on the Kern Cog board and are participating, uh, their staffs are participating uh, in the development of this plan. And, and uh, uh, so we hope that uh, there'll be a nice synergy here where we'll have some uh, uh, information for you on this specific strategy and then your group, um, the AB617 group, can provide us feedback and help inform that. And so we'll have a, an opportunity possibly with some questions uh, and maybe a, a little survey tool uh, next month. So that's it uh, for um, my uh, a brief overview, a preview of what's, what's to come. So it ought to be fun. Thank you, Rob. Are there any questions from anybody about um, the brief update that was just shared with us? All right. Go ahead. It looks like you wanted to say something, Jess. I was just going to thank Rob and certainly look forward. And definitely it's one of those um, kind of in the spirit of what we're going to do later in the meeting and talk about prioritization um, of measures. It's really nice to talk about something that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't discussed or heard an update on in a while. So we definitely look forward to that. Thank you. 
One quick question for you, Rob. Um, you're not quite off the hook yet. Uh, Gus is wondering, um, how did we get copies of that report? Yeah, the um, phase one report is actually on the Kern COG website. And if you just uh, go to the www.kerncog.org and type in uh, capital, uh, just cargo, but spelled K-A-R-G-O, cargo, uh, you should be able to call that uh, the phase one report up. It doesn't have as much in there related to truck, potential truck rerouting. Uh, uh, the phase two report we're in the middle of right now, and uh, your group were offering an opportunity to provide input on that phase two report. So there really isn't anything to see from that other than what I'll be presenting uh, from some of the preliminary information and studies that the consultant has put together on that. So we look forward to your input, all of your input on this uh, study. And all as always, and one of the one of the things that we've talked with Rob about is we will get that presentation or whatever materials he'll share. We'll get it ahead of time and get it out to the committee. So you'll have a chance ahead of that meeting as well. In Spanish and English. Yes, thanks, Rob. Wonderful. Thank you both. It looks like um, the link was just posted on there as well. So folks can reference that too. I think with that, we can move forward to our next agenda item. So um, this is a San Joaquin Valley interdisciplinary research team project update. And I believe we'll be hearing from several folks for this, um, including Nayamin Martinez, Ricardo Cisneros, and Jonathan London. So I'm going to hand it off to all of you. I'm sure one of you will kick us off. Thank you, Gabby, and thank you everyone for allowing us to be part of this meeting. I have a presentation that I will project in a minute. Uh, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, thank you everyone for allowing us the space to share with you about this community-based research project or investigación comunitaria. It is focused on AB 617 and um, we already gave this presentation to the Fresno folks, but we're here to talk to you and to uh, you know be able to answer your questions and and hopefully engage in this process. So my name is Nayamin Martinez. I am the executive director for the Central California Environmental Justice Network, better known as CCJN. My colleague Gustavo is part of your uh, steering committee, so you have worked closely with him. But part of this project um, is also uh, working with two researchers. One of them is here co-presenting with me tonight, uh, Dr. Jonathan London. Um, and then we also are partnering with two researchers from UC Merced, uh, Hilda Salte Gonzalez and Dr. Ricardo Cisneros, that uh, due to other commitments, we're unable to, to meet tonight, but uh, we'll try to explain as best as we can their, their portions of the study. So you might be wondering, what, what are you guys doing? I mean, we have already been working uh, in the implementation of AB 617 for, for several years, and all of a sudden we hear from you, well, uh, we have been working uh, and the goal of our project is really to help understand and document what are the impacts of the implementation of AB 617, both in Chapter and Fresno. Um, we would like to draw on community and agency perspectives. So you will hear from Dr. London of how we're gonna be collecting those uh, opinions and perspectives. We're also going to be doing analysis of our quality data, especially the data that has been collected through the additional air monitors that the air district put up as part of this process. And obviously, we would like to come up with some uh, potential recommendations of how this process could be improved. So uh, we're not doing this alone. We are uh, part of a three-year project that is funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And uh, we start our work together in March of 2021. We will continue until August of 2023. And we are uh, using different methodologies, including uh, an air quality monitoring analysis, a community survey that I'm sure several of you uh, were kind enough to respond. Uh, there's going to be also interviews with key stakeholders, 
meeting observation and an analysis of the community emission reduction plans or service. And with that, um, well, what we are, uh, are hoping to, to uh, fulfill through this report is answering some of these questions. How has air quality changed over time? Uh, what are the air quality perceptions that the, the residents have again over time? We did the first survey uh, did last year and we will do another survey in two years. And then also a policy report uh, trying to explain if the community priorities have been uh, implemented. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. London. Hi, thank you so much, Naimeen. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to be with you this evening. <clears throat> um, so we do have a number of methods as, as Naimeen mentioned. So um, the first that I'll describe is one that, that I'll be doing along with my team at UC Davis, which is the key stakeholder interviews. <clears throat> um, so those will be with everyone uh, or categories uh, of everyone here on the phone. So members of the CSEs, the Air District, other local governments, um, and CARB. Um, th these will be a sample. Um, so won't, won't literally be everyone on, on this uh, phone call, um, but we'll have a, uh, a group drawn to make that as representative as possible um, from each of those uh, types of um, types of respondents. Um, we really want to get uh, a broad and, and, and representative view of the, the different perceptions of AB 617 um, looking at these questions. So we'll be asking about your specific involvement. Um, how are you seeing the overall impacts um, towards the goals that the legislation has and that you have? Um, how has the process been going? Uh, I know there's, this is such an important thing about community inclusion and participation. So we're really interested to see how that is working. Um, and then uh, as, as you all know, you've done so much process and now moving into implementation. So we're really interested in um, what actually have been the impacts on the ground? Um, what, what has been um, implemented, how has funding been invested, um, and, uh, and then over time, what have the actual impacts been? Uh, and then we're, we're you know, really interested in, in this being a, a positive and constructive study. Um, so we'll be aiming towards developing recommendations, uh, and those will be significantly uh, informed by the kinds of things that you all, as truly as the experts there on the inside of the process, um, what your perceptions and and your suggestions are. Um, so that that will be the setup, and we'll we wanted to wait until we had these meetings with the CSEs to start the interviews. And now that we've done that, um, we're going to start scheduling those uh, as as soon as next week. Or we'll start scheduling them. We'll we'll carry them out probably starting by the end of the month. Next, please. Okay. So then there's the survey, uh, and this is being. Uh, uh, directed and, and run by Naimeen and Gus and their colleagues at CCEJN. Um, and so these are with residents in the Fresno and Shafter areas. Um, there's a set of validated questions, validated meaning that these have been used in other scientific studies before. Um, so we know that they get good, you know, um, uh, high quality uh, data that comes out of them. Um, so we're using these sets of questions um, about two things, uh, both perceptions of air quality and perceptions of health. So it's, um, it's not a health survey in the sense that we're not taking blood or things like that. Um, we are just asking about what's called self-reported health data as well as air quality perceptions. Um, and also as Naimeen already said, uh, we're doing it twice. One was this fall um, and, and well, la last summer and this fall. And then we'll do it again uh, towards the end of the project so we can hopefully see uh, change over time. Next. Um, and then uh, we've been observing the, uh, the CSC meetings and we have actually on, on the line, Henry Borison, um, who's taking notes and we had Jess Eisen um, for the last year or so. Um, so there we're, we're really interested in these questions of process, you know, who's speaking, What's the decision making look like? What kinds of outcomes are coming out of the these meetings? Um, what are the relationships looking like in terms of conflict and collaboration? Um, and how aligned are the 
uh, results of the meetings with um, with the interests of of community and and also interested in um, alignment with the range of different kinds of stakeholders with the agencies as well. Next, uh, and so then the uh, the next part, and this is run by our colleague uh, Ricardo Cisneros, who wasn't able to be here. Um, so. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, so we're looking at an exposure assessment um, of air quality data already being collected. This actually should say state and the air district. Um, so using the monitors um, that are uh, that are existing and then have been um, uh, located through AB 617. So there'll be um, some historic data based on as soon as those uh, monitors were in operation, uh, and then at the end of the study um, to try to look for changes over time um, and the different kinds of patterns uh, with geographical patterns, temporal patterns, uh, uh, air air quality uh, constituent patterns. Um, there are you know there are a number of challenges. This is a pretty modest grant, um, and so we're we're not claiming this is going to be a comprehensive assessment. Um, and also, uh, you know, we don't have our own air quality monitors. We're we're we reliant on on the others uh, that that the districts have district in this case has and CARB. Um, so we'll say to do the best that we can with available information. Next, please. Um, okay, so we want to turn this uh, into a conversation now uh, and hear from you um, to make this study most useful for the kinds of issues that you're working on and the goals that you have. Um, what would be the kinds of information that would serve those interests uh, best? Um, as we look towards the end of the project, uh, but really planning for that now, what would be the kinds of products that would be most helpful um, to put that information into? And then finally, how would you like to be engaging in the study? Uh, we do have a community advisory group. Uh, some of you, I think, are on that. I know some of you are on that. Um, uh, but there's other ways that, that people can be involved, giving us feedback along the way. Um, being able to, you know, review information as it comes, uh, working with us on some of the products towards the end, um, you know, a, a wide range of ways that, uh, that we'd welcome participation. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just open up the floor for uh, any responses to any of those questions. Um, actually, Naomi, do you maybe want to keep those questions up just to... Uh, have people to refer to, um, but but any any other kind of feedback or, or questions that you have for us uh, are also uh, are also welcomed. Please feel free to drop those in the chat, or if you would like to speak, um, you can always raise your hand, and um, we can queue up all the different questions. Not maybe, yeah, I was gonna say maybe I can ask. Do you? Um, I know since you already did this in Fresno, um, did you get feedback on some of these questions in Fresno? Like, what would you say would was there um, kind of feedback on how to engage in the study that maybe can prompt some thoughts here with this group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Jessica. Um, so there was an interest in the health survey and how that could link up with um, the diesel truck rerouting uh, survey or, or study uh, and any kind of health data that might come out of that <clears throat> or, or at least exposure data. Uh, that was one. And then um, a couple of questions just about the air quality monitoring and, and how that uh, was going to be rolling out. Um, I think those are the two key things. Naimeen, I mean, were there others that I'm that I'm forgetting now? No, nope, you cover it. Okay. All right, thank you. And you know, you don't have to just answer these questions. If there's any reaction or comments about the study or things that you would like to share about you think this is relevant or not, or you know, how we can help you guys. Um, any comments are more than welcome. And if you feel nervous or you feel like you don't want to do it right now, at the bottom of this slide, and I'll put it right now, copy in the chat, 
there is our respective emails, uh, Dr. Jonathan London, Dr. Dr. Ricardo Cisneros, and myself, Nayamin, that I'll put on the chat so that if you don't feel comfortable making any comments or asking questions uh, at this moment, you can always contact us at a later time. Thank you, um, Dr. London and Nayamin. Last chance for any comments or questions. Hi, good evening. Yeah, Gustavo, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think one of maybe to Are add one of the- Are you Gustavo speaking? Yeah, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, we can hear you. No, I think- um, I, I can hear panel? him. I can yeah. hear him, yeah. Okay. Is he in oh. the main channel or in the Spanish channel? Yeah, I just want to double check because I have um, original audio muted. Um, I am in the English channel and I was able to hear him. Yeah, I, I can hear him from the English channel as well. Yeah, our, our, our original audio is not muted. That's why we can hear him, I think. Okay, go ahead, Gustavo. I'm sorry, okay. I cannot hear him. Yeah, yeah but I, I think, Gustavo, but you called in from your cell phone. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's why. So we're going to have to unmute original audio, mm -hmm. um, Angie and Gabby, so mm -hmm. that we can hear Gustavo because he called in. Yes, thank you for that. So I'm doing a quick redirect just so that anybody else um, who is um, in the English channel, please make sure to select unmute original audio. This way we can hear Gustavo since he called in. I'm confirming that I was able to hear his voice slightly. Um, so I think if everybody's ready, uh, Gustavo, you can share your question. Yeah, I, I think one maybe adding one question to the survey will be, uh, you know, define or identifying what, uh, because if we are looking at how effective is the 617 in terms of uh, pollution reduction, maybe uh, defining or identifying what is being reduced with uh, the SERPs, the projects to reduce the pollution that are new ideas from uh, 617 uh, in comparison with uh, the current projects that the air districts have. Because uh, I think uh, if we are, if I think we need not to double count, double deep of, uh, a project. So, what's uh, what's new? What's uh, coming up uh, on six one seven that was not there before? So we can say this is really a six one seven result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Gustavo. Thank you so much. I know that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and we, you know, we we did do one round of the survey, but but it's it's actually probably a good thing to add for the, the second round, I mean, because that, that would really kind of capture the whole you know, timeline. Uh, so that, that's, that's just really helpful feedback. Thank you, Gustavo. And thank you everyone um, for being quick to kind of transition our settings for this. And Thanks. I think you have a follow-up, Gustavo, or Gus actually. Yeah, how's it going? Uh, good evening. Thank you for, for that overview. Uh, one question on, so this was kind of like phase one or, or round one of the surveys. For round two, are the same individuals going to be surveyed or will they also be, uh, can new folks participate in the survey? Um, go ahead, Naimi. It is going to be, uh, so the survey did not have uh, identifiers or personal identifiers like names or anything like that. And uh, so therefore, even if we wanted to, to, you know, go back to the same people, we can't. And we wanted to do that to respect the, you know, people be, wanted to be anonymous. So we're going to use the same criteria. So people who live or work in the ABC sponsored area, both in front and chapter, will be eligible to, to participate, uh, even if they did not participate in the first one. But obviously, we want to also get responses from the same individuals, so they will be approached to participate. But it's not like exclusive, only for the people who, who respond the first survey. Thank you so much. 
And just to add, it's not a huge sample. We did uh, 50 surveys in chapter and 102 in Fresno. So the reason why the, the larger number of Fresno is just because the size of the community, but uh, the goal is to, to repeat and, and get another 150 um, two years from now. Thank you for providing that um, response. And I should say, um, continue to welcome other questions, but one thing I didn't mention in terms of this CSC that we will come back to you um, when we are moving into the products phase, uh, the documentation phase, uh, both to get some, uh, share some of our uh, findings that are going to go into the products and then to get some input on, you know, what, what kinds of things would be most helpful because, you know, we'll have academic articles and things like that, but for, for that part of the audience, but we really want to have products that are going to be useful for this, this audience, for these participants, you all. Um, so getting your kinds of feedback on, you know, whether it's issue briefs or infographics or op-ed pieces or di different ways of communicating um, that are going to be most relevant and, and, and helpful. So do, do expect us uh, back um, at least that that um, next time, but in the meantime, as I mean, has and you have our uh, contact there, please get in contact with us at any time with questions or concerns or suggestions. Thank you all. I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think um, we can probably transition to our next agenda item. Um, and I want to just reiterate what has been expressed in the chat um, by my colleague, Dr. Amy Ramos. We really appreciate everybody's patience with technology today as we're transitioning um, our translation processes. Um, and just to reiterate for those who tend to be more like auditory folks, if you're in the English channel, just stay there, but make sure that the original audio is unmuted um, as we do have some folks calling in. So this way we can hear everybody. Um, okay, so I'm gonna transition us next to the SERP measure prioritization discussion. Um, and um, Jessica Olson will be kicking us off and I will be sharing my screen in just a second. Thank you, Gabby. And while she kind of pulls up her screen, so I'll just kind of walk us through really quickly before we even get to the slides, kind of what, how we kind of got here and what we've done the past um, couple of meetings to sort of set us up. So um, in November, we had sort of our final discussion about our annual report. And if you recall, and this was the second year that we've had an annual report, we are required to report to CARB annually and take it through our board, our progress on CERT measures. So it's actually very related to what Naimeen and Dr. London were just talking about. Progress in this term, um, it's kind of a structured report, um, but we did really appreciate a lot of the feedback and definitely want to incorporate a lot of the um, design elements and other things that folks were interested in and making the report a little bit more accessible moving forward. But throughout that discussion, there were certain, um, a lot of different comments from a lot of different people that were generally about different types of CERT measures and sort of um, kind of expressing maybe a little bit of um, uh, kind of differing opinions about which measures are maybe more important to one another. And it made us sort of step back and realize that for the Shafter Committee, we haven't really done a, a true prioritization exercise. So we took the following meeting, which was our December meeting, to really kind of break up all of our incentives measures and highlight sort of four different buckets. And so we'll go over those really quickly again, not the measures themselves, but sort of what those buckets meant. And then sort of use that as a stepping stone for what will be a prioritization survey we're going to send out after this meeting um, um, in a few days after, um, this week. Uh, and and don't, don't be afraid, we'll definitely call all the folks um, that need help and assistance in filling out the survey. It's sort of an interactive thing that we've been working on with Harder and Company. But Harder and Company were kind enough to sort of work with us and understand that maybe we needed a little bit more discussion on sort of what prioritization means and kind of how we set that discussion up. So later on, Gabby will be going over that. But I'll, if you can go to the next slide, 
just kind of set us up a little bit for why SERP prioritization is important. Um, so of course, as I mentioned, not only was there interest from you all to prioritize, but just taking a step back, something we've talked about a lot over the past couple of months is that the district has to work to draft project plans that are required to submit to CARB um, in order to get a lot, not all, but a lot of the incentives measures funded. And I'll, we talked about that last meeting and we kind of talked about the different buckets they all sat in. One of the other main things that we do really throughout all of these meetings and a perfect ex example is last meeting, we brought to you a flyer about burn cleaner. So the wood stove change out program and get feedback about outreach and how we can get different measures off the ground. But in order to, we obviously, we have lots of measures so we can't talk about every measure, every meeting. So in order for the district to understand which project plans and which outreach strategies we wanna develop with the CSC, we really want to understand the community's priorities. And what we mean by that are, we wanna know kind of the collective or the community-based interest in discussing cert measure progress, working on those outreach measures, for example, like that flyer. Do we wanna do more of that where we work in CSC meetings to talk about the, the flyers? Um, and reevaluating support. We've talked a lot about certain measures that, hey, maybe it, you know, it's, it's not getting off the ground. It doesn't seem like a lot of people are taking advantage, but on the flip side, maybe there's some that are oversubscribed. A perfect example is the lawn and garden equipment. So in order for us to have that conversation, it's so much better if we have kind of a comprehensive understanding of the order or the ranking of all of the different measures. Next slide, please. So this is just sort of a reminder, it's not broken up by measure, but just a reminder um, as to why there are certain measures that sort of have, they're kind of in different stage, stages of like implementation. And that's because of these project plans in some cases. So there are the kinds that need no project plan. And we talked about each one of these four in our slides from last meeting. And maybe Zong, I don't know, can you take, um, add the link to the slides from the last meeting? Um, that way, folks, you can kind of take a look and remind yourselves which measures in particular fall into each of these buckets. But those are measures that can be funded right now. So an example are school bus measures, a uh, school bus replacement. The second are program plans that we've already worked on that have already been approved. And so in this case, those measures can be funded now because we went through that process and we've approved them and we've sent them out to you as a committee. And another, an example of that would be the wood stove change out or burn cleaner, or another example of that would be our lawn and garden. So those are programs we're already funding and you all have been a great part of that. Then there are two other remaining buckets. One is that we're awaiting approval. So we've submitted and posted the draft program plans on our website for you all to take a look at. And then there's also those that we have yet to to draft, we're kind of working on them based on priority order from our original prioritization exercise we did right after we adopted the SERP. So all of that said, um, just sort of to kind of lay the foundation for why we think a prioritization exercise is really important. Um, and with that, unless there are any questions specifically about these, I'm gonna pass it really to Harder and Company to walk us through um, what we hope is a really good exercise to set us up for success to have a meaningful prioritization exercise. Thank you, Jess. Uh, I'll just pause quickly to see if there's any questions so far. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, get us started. It's I know it's 5 p.m. on a Monday, um, and it's the first CSC meeting of the new year. So this is I can tell this group is really quiet, but I hope that you all will engage in some conversation with me. Um, and hopefully uh, the warm up question that we have for you today will be kind of a fun exercise that'll get us um, in the right headspace to talk a little bit more about prioritization processes. Um, I'm just going to let you know, um, because I'm sharing my screen, I'm not able to see the chat very quickly. So you may hear my colleague, Dr. Amy Ramos, chime in here and there to let me know if there's questions in the chat, um, as well as if, if somebody has raised their hand. So I just wanted to um, share that up front. So um, today we want to talk about, you know, what it takes to make a decision and more specifically, what does it take to prioritize something um, as you're making a decision, you know, because a lot of times we want a lot of things, but we can't have everything. So um, to get us started in thinking about that, we want to ask you today, um, 
how do you decide what you um, wh where you want to go for dinner? And um, this is probably a common question that most of us have to make on or ask ourselves on a regular basis. And depending on how much you like to cook, you might have to ask yourself this pretty much daily. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some example criteria that you might make um, to that you might use to make a choice. So um, in this next screen, um, we're going to talk about two example criteria. So um, proximity might be one of these criteria. So Proximity looks like thinking to myself, you know, how close is the restaurant where I want to get food? Can I walk? You know, do I need to take a take my bike there? Do I need to drive? And how much does that matter to me, right? Like maybe I prefer to walk to a restaurant, so I want something really close, but maybe I don't care. Maybe I um I have a favorite restaurant and it doesn't matter to me that something's really far away because that's the food that I want to get. So that's kind of an example of what criteria looks like. Um, I'm going to pause now just quickly because I'd like to hear from you all. You know, is proximity something that you consider as well when you're choosing where you want to eat? And um, what are what are some of the reasons why proximity might matter to you? And I know it's a really quiet group. I don't want to be like that one teacher who used to, you know, call on random folks. So thank you, Michelle, for volunteering to, to share. Okay, do, do I have this, the channel right? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Michelle. Okay. Um, well, we live in Shafter, and sometimes we end up in Bakersfield. So it is, a, it is a conversation. Well, where are we? We're at Lowe's. I don't want to drive across town to go have dinner. Um, we're going to pick somewhere close to where we are. Um, as we're running our errands and so it is a conversation we happen to have a lot I mean probably the first one is you know who has the best drinks well it should be real but you know the um is where it is and you know and living in chapter we have very limited choices sometimes you know you can walk to some of them and some of them you can't but it is a very uh it is a topic a lot in our house thank you Michelle um, Gus, would you like to share? Uh, yes, and just to understand this example of the criteria for like the hypothetical dinner that this is an example that we're going to use in real life, but for SERP measures right up next. This is just, okay. Yep, it's okay. like you have my slide deck somehow, Gus. We'll get no, there no, in no, just no, a no, couple no. minutes. I'm trying to, okay, yeah, but yeah. I do want to answer it. Um, yeah, if proximity definitely is, is uh, like, you know, hypothetically thinking of dinner, yeah, proximity would definitely be something that, that I would think about, especially with small children. I don't want to drive too far because then I still have a, a baby and she might fall asleep on the way there. So, <laughs> so that's something that I do uh, think about. And then the, the complex, all right, as well, like, you know, is it, friendly for children right that's something that I'm always thinking of or do we have to reserve online usually we have to reserve online or call ahead we just tend to stay away from it we try to go for like the easier thing so hypothetically that's that's kind of there is some precedent in like choosing dinner definitely thank you Gus so yeah that's actually a great transition to talk a little bit more about what we mean by complexity so um, you know, what we really mean when we say complexity is like how hard or how easy is it to do something, right? And so as Gus was just saying exactly right, you know, do I, can I, do I have to use an online application to order? Can I call in? Can I just order in person? Um, and depending on what I'm comfortable with or how much energy I have in the day, some things might make it easier or harder for me to place an order. But what we want to say about complexity as well is that sometimes it's a good thing, right? Sometimes it's actually worth it. So for example, um, Valentine's Day is coming up and pretending COVID was not an issue. You know, lots of folks like to go out for a nice fancy dinner with their significant others. And in that case, you probably don't care that you have to make a reservation in advance, that you have to dress nicer um, or... Um, that the menu is kind of hard to read and you know the lights dim at that place and usually that bothers you but all of a sudden you know complexity even though it's still a factor is something you care less about and you're still more likely to make that choice because it's important to you to go somewhere nice for a special occasion 
So with that, just wanted to share that all of these factors kind of have, there's like two sides to each of them. And sometimes it's still worth it. Um, even when, um, you know, usually you think, oh, something's complex, I steer away from it. But there are cases where that's exactly what you want to do. Um, does anybody else have examples of what complexity can look like when you're choosing to order or, you know, when you're choosing where you want to go for dinner? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Gustavo. Yeah, I'm sorry. Again, uh, well, I think uh, choosing where to eat is uh, how healthy is the food uh, there is, uh, you know, it's going to help uh, me because it's a healthy food or it's just uh, junk food. So thinking about my health, you know, uh, that's important also. Thank you, Gustavo. That's actually a great um, transition to the question I have for everybody, which is um, more about um, what other considerations you have when you decide where where to go eat. You know, what are some other things? So not proximity, not complexity, but what are some other things that you take into consideration? So Gustavo just shared with us that health is a big factor for him. And so um, what, yeah, what are some other examples? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. And Gabby, um, Steve also shared nostalgia, right? You might have, uh, you went there with your parents when you were young. It might not be the best food ever, but you just have this warm, cozy feeling when you go there and you want to go back and you want to carry on that tradition. There's that nostalgia might be a motivating factor, something that you consider when you go out to eat. Thank you for elevating that comment, Dr. Amy. Um, are there any other factors that you think about when you decide where you want to go eat? Yes, Gus? Yeah, another consideration that I would have uh, definitely would be um, we try to shop or like consume very hyper local and like micro businesses and try to stay from like big chain or big, you know, fast food restaurants. So that's another major consideration that, you know, especially when it's like spending my personal money or my spouse's money, we always think about like what kind of ripple effect it could have. And we always think about like, you know, consuming some tacos, you know, the corner rather than going to like some major hamburger chain joint, you know, so that that's a, a, a big consideration and, and like an authentic consideration on like how, if I'm consuming something for myself and it's going to cost me money, um, where that money, you know, should be allocated to. So that, that's another consideration that I would have. Definitely, Gus. And, you know, along the lines of money is just money in general, right? Like how expensive is it going to be? How much do I want to spend on, my, on, on a meal today? Maybe I want to splurge because I had a really hard day or maybe I'm like trying to stick to a budget. So those are some other examples. Um, is there other criteria that comes to mind for you um, and maybe why that criteria is important to you as well? All right, well, I'm seeing um, no more comments. So I think with that, um, you know, thank you to those of you who are sort of joining in that exercise and we hope that it helps to kind of bridge um, the conversation between this and the prioritization for the SERP measures in a way that seems a little bit more approachable. And I wanna encourage um, those who you know, feel less comfortable speaking up to really share with us today because getting your input um, on the criteria that's important for prioritizing really makes sure that we are putting forth um, the measures that are most important to you and that you're most eager to tackle first. So it's hard for us to tell um, what direction to go in if we're not getting authentic feedback. So please feel comfortable um, sharing with us today. So as you can see in this example, even choosing a meal is pretty complicated. So as we're thinking about the SERP measures, you know, there's so many different measures to implement to um, reduce emissions in your community, from heavy duty trucks to indoor air quality. Um, it, it can be hard to think about which one of these you want to tackle first. So we want to talk about some considerations that might help you to prioritize and we want to start off by saying that we know that all of these measures are important to you. Um, and that's probably why you're here. Um, but the purpose of this activity is really to get us thinking about 
how we choose what to focus on first and also why we choose to focus on that first, right? So for, for that choice to be very meaningful and, and have true intention. So this helps us really um, be able to back up the decisions that we're making. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, provide an example. And for the purpose of today, we're gonna be using passenger vehicles as an example. Um, I think this is hopefully one that's um, approachable for everybody and probably something that affects most of us on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we all have experience being in vehicles, whether it's to go to work, to go to school, um, to take children to school, run some errands, and we use different modes of transportation to get to places. So the question, you know, when addressing um, this measure would be, how do we as a community um, want to decide how important it is um, for this measure to be something that we work on sooner as opposed to later? And so we know that putting a regulation on the types of vehicles in our community would have a positive impact um, as we know that emissions from these vehicles have effects on folks' health, but there's a lot to think about, right? There's so many different kinds of vehicles, you know, zero emissions, battery operated vehicles, older cars that are struggling to pass their smog check. Anybody else have a 95 Corolla still sitting in their driveway? I think those are um, pretty much going to outlive all of us at this point. Um, and, you know, there's diesel operated vehicles too. So there's a lot to consider. Um, but I'm going to share some criteria that we, we can use to help to assess how important this measure is to, to you, because truly it might be more important to you than to another fellow CSC member, than to myself, than to someone at the Air District. So this is a very personal exercise, but we're walking through the example together to really help um, everybody understand how we prioritize to maximize benefit for everyone in the community. So, you know, similar to the restaurant example, we have the same two criteria here, proximity and complexity. So when you think about pro proximity as it relates to vehicle emissions, um, instead of thinking about how close the restaurant is, maybe you're thinking about how close do I live to this freeway? You know, how does my proximity, my physical proximity to this issue affect my day-to-day -day life? So I'm going to posit this proximity piece and ask you, what are some other examples where proximity might affect how you think about passenger vehicles? So I shared this freeway example, but I know you all are super um, informed on this work. So I really want to hear some other examples about how proximity might affect how you think about passenger vehicles. Anyone can share. There's no right or wrong answer. Hello. Uh, yes, Gustavo. Yes, uh, I think uh, an example of proximity. Uh, I think in my neighborhood, uh, there is a uh, street that uh, it used to be like a quiet neighborhood with one school. And uh, in the recent years, uh, there are a new high school and other two elementary uh, schools. So there are four schools within two blocks uh, of distance, you know, between the, the two blocks. And uh, being a two-way street, now the congestion of uh, cars <laughs> goes all the way to the entrance of the freeway, 50A freeway. So, in the morning and in the afternoon, uh, there is a huge traffic, uh, you know, congestion in that area. I think, uh, you know, looking to not uh, pollute, I think planners need to think about that. You know, it's only two-way street. Uh, they, I'm assuming they didn't think about that because now there is a huge problem about traffic and, you know, traffic being, you know, very slow and being there for a long time, uh, long term, you know, polluting. Thank you, Gustavo. So in that example, you know, you're not only close to this poorly designed 
freeway entrance slash intersection and and you're noticing that the traffic and congestion causes more pollution so it's you know it's directly affecting you pretty much on a daily basis so this seems to be like a, a very important um, consideration for you um i'm gonna now share an example or talk a little bit more about how complexity might apply um when we think about um vehicle, uh, passenger vehicles. So um, when we think about complexity, we want to really focus on how much do you care what how complicated something is, right? How much is that going to factor into your decision making? So, you know, we thought ordering food was complicated, but selecting measures to implement a SERP might be even more complicated. So for example, with passenger, passenger vehicles might be a complex topic because there's so many different vehicles that people drive, there may not be a universal solution, right? And then on top of that, you know, some examples that you can see on the screen here are, is there a car project plan required? Um, does the district have to create a new program in order for this to happen? So there can be a lot of factors in there. However, if this is an important issue to you, the, the level of complexity matters less, right? Because you still want to get started and doing something um, pretty much immediately, right? And you could be on the total opposite side of the spectrum where you're looking at the same exact problem and you think to yourself, this doesn't seem that complicated to me. Maybe you're an expert in passenger vehicles um, measures, right? So you have a lot of solutions to offer. So, at the same time, you are also thinking to yourself, complexity doesn't matter much to me either because I want to get started on this soon. So you can be on two sides of the spectrum and still have that same answer of complexity doesn't matter much to me, even though you're approaching it from a very different angle. Um, I'd love to hear from you all how else you think about um, how um, complexity is a factor when you think about the passenger vehicles measure. And I, I want to add, oh, sorry, Michelle, I was going to, all I was going to add was um, to, to Gabby's point, you can be on the opposite end. One of your other thoughts, and maybe the thought when we were thinking of some of these criteria was that complexity, because of things like project plans and new programs, maybe ranks it higher because it's complex, not necessarily because it's too complicated, but because, hey, in order to get this off the ground in time, we need to rank the complex ones perhaps higher if that is one of your criteria personally for your rankings. Yeah, thank you for adding that, um, Jess. And Michelle, please, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, are we still talking, are we talking about the CARBS projected plan? Are we talking still about, you know, the CARS, an example of how, how uh, you know, things are complex? I mean, you know, there's a lot of complexities in that is, you know, the size of the car I drive is the size of my family that fits into it. The, you know, I mean, I understand the school because there's a school from me and direction to my work. And if I drive by when school's getting out, I have to drive a longer route. So there's a lot of complexities there. Um, some people um, like fast cars, some people don't care. There, it is very, um, complex of, of what we want and what the car, how does carb fit everything for everybody? I mean, you know, um, a lawnmower is a lot easier to say, hey, it cuts the grass, it's electric or it's not, and it does a good job, but a car doesn't fit all of it. And some people carry their dogs, some people carry, uh, do a lot of shopping and need a lot of space. And so it is complex. Are we talking about limiting the cars are changing what we want from our cars in our community. Yeah, so to your last point, um, Michelle, where this is sort of a hypothetical exercise, right? So when if you were to think about um, prioritizing the passenger vehicles measure, um, we're talking about how complexity of, of this measure itself kind of would factor into your, your personal ranking, right? So you just shared um, several factors and considerations with us, um, including types of vehicles, why it sounds like vehicle, uh, vehicle choice is a very personal matter as well. And so, yeah, just thinking about how those factors would 
kind of sway your decision one way or the other. So um, as Jess um, was sharing with everybody earlier, sometimes things are complex and that's exactly why you wanna prioritize them so you can tackle them right then and there. And sometimes what seems complex to you seems pretty simple to somebody else. And so they might also wanna get started right away because it seems approachable. So um, all that to say, there's like many angles to look at, at um, these factors. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to walk us through two more criteria just very quickly. So these are some other um, some other factors that um, uh, kind of will have an impact on these decisions. So this proposed criteria here that um, says emissions reductions really means, you know, is this going to yield the highest emissions reductions in my community? So this criteria allows us to make a cost benefit analysis really allows us to think about the pros and cons on getting started, right? So for example, you may think passenger vehicles is a really complicated measure. However, you also think that focusing on a solution to this is gonna have the most impact in reducing emissions quickly. So this might incentivize you to be like, it doesn't matter how complicated it is, right? I wanna get started. So you would um, rank this criteria of emissions reductions pretty highly. Um, is emissions reduction something that you would consider as well? And how would how would you all explain this to somebody else? I'd love to hear how somebody else is um, thinking about emissions reductions as a criteria. Hello. Hi, Gustavo. Gustavo again. Thank you. Yeah, if, uh, my comment is a lot. Yeah. Uh, the topic, but but uh, I think uh, you know. Wait, Gustavo, I think you're cutting impact, off you know? a little bit. Um, but I think we're getting you back. Let's just try like one more sentence, and I'll let you know. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying is that I think the impact, you know. I think uh, the two questions uh, are uh, kind of related uh, because one is, you know, thinking about the measure, you know, to on cars, but the other one is, uh, you know, the example I gave about, you know, very poor uh, planning in terms of streets, uh, you know, is not only uh, measures on cars, you know, what kind of cars, electric cars or all of that, but. Also, you know, what uh, the infrastructure that needs to support uh, the, the traffic, you know, because having a uh, better planned uh, infrastructure for traffic, that also can reduce the pollution because uh, I think the example I gave, when there is no school, that they're going to school or leaving the school, I can go through that neighborhood like in three minutes. When there is a, in the morning or a fat of afternoon, it can be from half hour to an hour. So I will be polluting like a uh, hundred times more than normal. So I think uh, my point is not only measure for cars, but infrastructure also, you know, that uh, to support, you know, the traffic. I think we need to look beyond just uh, cars uh, themselves, but, uh, you know, other infrastructure that is needed to, to drive our cars. This is a great example, Gustavo, because this is exactly the kind of thinking that um, we would love you all to engage in as you're um, answering a survey later this week, right? So, you're going to be doing this assessment um, of the criteria across each of the different um, the different measures. And as you're doing that, you're going to have to do a little bit of comparison, right? Like this is important to me for these reasons. And I also know this is like I also know infrastructure plays a role. Right. So doing more of that, like cross sectional analysis is going to help you come up with a prioritized um, score, which we'll talk about in a little bit, right? But if, if you're ranking everything really highly, that just leaves you with a list where everything is like right at the top. So we have to make some decisions. Um, and so it's just great to hear um, that really concrete example, Gustavo. Yeah, and I think my comment is kind of aligned with uh, the comments that uh, uh, Nayamin and uh, 
the, the, the other guy did is uh, the truck drift outing, you know, is uh, how they pollute uh, in the neighborhoods. And that's very similar to what is going on with chapter, you know, trucks going through the heart of the community and <laughs> rail routes is the same with RV Lamont, you know, diesel trucks going through the heart of the community. So drift outing can be a solution and that's uh, something similar for regular cars. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, thank you for that comment. I'm gonna actually just share the very last um, proposed criteria that we have here, which is overall community concern. So this is probably um, the one that's most personal to all of you. So you're coming to these meetings, you understand the concerns in your community, you understand how all of these measures are impacting uh, the life of your neighbors, your friends, your family. So when you think about um, the passenger vehicles measure, um, what's your general sort of feeling or your connection to this measure? So this criteria helps us to think about whether this measure is something that I value with you know, high, moderate, or low importance. It also helps you to think about why you value it, right? So we might value something highly if it relates to our personal or our day-to-day -day experience. And we may think that something is of lower importance if it doesn't affect us personally, right? And so um, in this example of um, overall community concern, we really want you all to think about why is this a personal concern to you and how highly does it rank? And eventually, you know, how highly is this a, a personal concern that you have for your community um, compared to other measures, right? So like maybe you're super passionate about passenger vehicles. So that ranks like right at the top for you. And, but you're, and then you're kind of, your second passion is this infrastructure um, measure that Gustavo was talking about. So this is again, an opportunity that, to think about why this is important. Um, I'd love to invite anybody who, um, who has any thoughts to, to share with us about how um, the overall community concern um, criteria, how you would explain this this consideration to somebody? And why is this an important consideration for us to have when we're doing this, this ranking exercise? And there's no right or wrong answer, I promise you. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts. Gus? Yeah, and just looking at the, the graph here in front of us, um, like, are we looking at whether we more inclined to emissions reduction overall versus overall community concern? No, I think these are completely separate factors. So if you're thinking about passenger vehicles, the way we will conduct this exercise is you'll think about all four of these things, right? First, you'll think about, sorry, let me go back. You'll think about how proximity is a factor. You'll think about how complexity is a factor. And I'll, I'll walk through that exercise in a little bit. Um, and then, oops, you will also think about how emissions reduction plays a role in the passenger vehicles measure. And then you'll also think about how the community concern is a factor. So all of these are separate, um, but they work together to help us come up with a score that helps us assess sort of the ranking. Then Gus, to your point, the question is, when you think about overall community concern, how do you interpret that? What is that factor? So I could say, I'll give an example of my own. I might be, uh, have a, think that it's a community concern that's um, high because I see a lot of children walking to school. I live in a neighborhood where kids walk to school. And if there's a lot of vehicle emissions, like I'm concerned about the kids in my neighborhood being exposed to excess pollution. So I might say, oh, maybe for me as an individual, it's not, you know, I'm not a child, but I'm concerned about the well being of my overall community. Therefore, I'm going to rank this one kind of high for my overall community concern score. Um, so how would you interpret it? So if, if you were like on the spot right now to give this a ranking, that is to give vehicle emissions a ranking, what is your decision making process to rank overall community concern? 
Yeah, no, thank you for, for framing that. Um, and I, I think just taking a step back, if, you know, when we first started this and, and recently, when we look at like what the major concerns in the community were and what the data showed us, like what the California Resources Board and the Valley Air District <clears throat> showed us in, in their data is that, you know, we'll say, if, you know, nearly half of emissions um, in this in this community, really in the Central Valley, come from you know mobile emissions, right, or, or mobile sources. Um, so I think the overall community concern is is very very high, right? Um, and that's demonstrated through like the the requesting of like vegetative barriers, <clears throat> the requesting of like um, uh, putting air monitors at Laredo Highway where, where this elementary school is that has two different um, stops. And so, yeah, I definitely think that emissions reductions in vehicle emissions is probably a very, very high priority. Uh, and I think the concern looking at the data is, you know, nearly half or somewhere in that ballpark um, is what is captured in data of, you know, um, of like contaminating the air, right? Or, or, or giving bad air days, right? A lot of the vehicle emissions are, are very high. So I think it would be a, a big concern and also a big push to like really get some traction in the emission reduction of vehicle emissions, definitely. Um, and I think there is there was at least some very, very solid uh, certain measures that, that tackled this and looked at this in, in many different ways. Um, and so, yeah, if we're, we're looking at that, then transferring this information to the SERP, then I, th I think it would be a great place to really, like, analyze this of, like, the what are the different measures in the SERP that already talk about um, either the reduction of emission, uh, be, uh, vehicle emissions or alternatives to that, right, where there's, like, ride share programs, there's van share programs for that, cultural workers, et cetera. So I, I think that... That's really crucial. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh. I was just going to add a little bit, Gabby, there, because I think I want to elevate a couple of things that Gus shared. So you're sharing your own decision making, right? So you, as a CSE member, are saying, if I if I could just pull out the, the threads there of your decision making, you have access to the data, right? Whether it's through these meetings, you read those charts, you see the data, the science behind um, the emissions in your community, you now are using that evidence there to rank this one isolated measure higher, right? It's going to be very high. And then you shared other data that you have available that you're probably going to use for consideration when you rank the other measures. So notice here that we are going just through the vehicle uh, in passenger uh, passenger vehicles uh, cert measure. And then we'll repeat this over and over for all the other measures. So I'm really glad that you shared that, Gus, because it allows us to unpack several ways of thinking that will be needed to be used for each of the different measures. So you kind of answered our question and then added a whole bunch more. So this is perfect. And then I'll pass it to, to Michelle. Yeah, may I uh, make another uh, comment? Um, one second, Gustavo. We have Michelle raising um, her hand. I'm not sure if she can hear us right now. Um, yes, I can. So we're all of us on the CS. Oh, the I always get my letters mixed up. The, uh, on the community, um, we'll get a survey just on this measure of emissions reductions, and we're going to tell you what we feel about this measure. We're not going to compare it to what I feel about vegetation or what I feel about uh, air filtration or anything. We're just talking about this one and everybody on the committee is gonna get a survey. Is that correct? Almost, Michelle. So for today, we're only talking about um, the passenger vehicles, but when you get that survey, you're actually going to be looking at all of them. But today we're walking through an exercise where we're just thinking about one, just to kind of walk you through that example. And, and if I could just add to offer, the, it, exactly to what Gabby said, the idea is that we do have an overall ranking of what the, in general, collectively, the highest sort of 
priority measures are for the CSC. And so the, the really the exercise today is to sort of get you thinking, well, what does priority mean to me? How do I rank them unless I know what criteria to rank them against? So today was, you know, and kind of, I think Gabby has a few more slides to share with us. So we'll sort of help you go through that survey. And then the results that we plan to share at the next meeting and ahead of the next meeting, I should say, so that everyone can take a look, will then show you all kind of collectively what everyone, you know, we all think a little differently, but generally as a CSC, we'll probably most likely, I imagine we're going to see really high rankings for things like Gustavo mentioned, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, some of the passenger vehicles, all of the heavy emissions, you know, um, stuff from the heavy duty trucks or diesel, kind of the main concerns we've heard, but it'll be a little bit more like we'll be more solidified in that those are the priorities because we went through this exercise, not just because it's what we're kind of hearing meeting after meeting. It'll feel a little bit more concrete. Thank you, Jess. I'm going to skip to the next slide. Uh, as I'm doing that, um, Gustavo, if you still have a comment um, and would like to share with us, I welcome it. Yeah, I think uh, maybe just following up, uh, aligned with the comments, I think if we are talk, just talking about passenger cars, uh, that's one thing, but, you know, I work with communities, both chapter, Arvin Lamont, and uh, I think if we compare passenger cars with, uh, you know, heavy trucks, I think uh, residents will say, you know, we are really concerned about the big trucks, the diesel mm -hmm. trucks, mm -hmm. you know, and the passenger cars may not be as high because, uh, you know, those are the comments that I'm getting from the community, but I think uh, if at the end of the day, you know, we are, you know, ranking them based on importance from uh, the state committee and residents. Mm -hmm. But that's just one observation that uh, if you talk to residents, diesel trucks will be higher than passenger cars. Yeah, that's a great example, Gustavo. Of, you know, if you, when you're getting the survey and you're, you're writing that answer, and you think about community concern, you have that perspective, right? So to you, you're like, well, if I was ranking the importance of passenger vehicles compared to the importance of heavy duty trucking, heavy duty trucking is going to get the highest ranking for me because that's what I'm hearing from, from my neighbors and my community, right? And then passenger vehicles maybe get like the next score down. So that's an excellent example of exactly the kind of thought process that's going to go into this prioritization. Um, I'm going to just ge in general um, ask you all to share with me um, other criteria that you have um, when you're thinking about what it's going to take to prioritize a measure. So, you know, similar to how when you're choosing a restaurant, people had other criteria like cost, cravings, sustainability, all of that, right? You might have other selection criteria when you're thinking about prioritizing a measure. So. Um, I would love to hear from anybody, um, you know, what are some other things that you think about? Why are those things important to you? And um, yeah, would welcome any of those thoughts. Looks like um, Gus has a, a thought for us. Go ahead, Gus. I'm sorry, and, and I know I've, I've talked quite a bit. Uh, I want to give space to others, encourage them to to share if possible. Um, but other considerations, I think, uh, like as we move to, um, and I guess the question is, from here, um, there'll be a survey that will look at the entire SERPs, uh, SERP measures, and we're gonna together or individually go through that and rank them. Is it okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. it, it'll be an individual exercise, but as as Jessica shared with you all, um, we're going to take the collective scores to have an understanding of, of what mm -hmm. it, the prioritization is looking like, kind of across the board. Got it. Mm -hmm. So, um, if if you have other criteria that comes to mind, feel free to drop that in the chat. I'm very briefly going to walk through like an example of how I would answer this myself, right? So when I think about um, passenger vehicles, how important are some of these considerations to me, right? So I live um, in Sacramento, California. I'm very close to the 99. Um, 
So for me, proximity, if I'm ranking it um, on a scale of one to four, four being a very important consideration, proximity is a four for me because the freeway is like two blocks down, right? But if I'm thinking about complexity, um, uh, personally, I might find this issue to be one where I, I think it's complex, but I think it's worth the complexity, right? So I would probably, again, rank this very high. Um, on the issue of emissions reductions, similar to what folks are sharing, um, knowing kind of the effects of, of what um, those emissions are doing on a daily basis, I would also rank this really high, knowing that if some measures were in place, the emissions would be reduced in my community and the air quality would significantly improve. But maybe an overall community concern, um, I don't know if people are experiencing the health effects because of passenger vehicles as opposed to like heavy duty trucking, right? So maybe for me, I would rank the overall community concern a two and then if I were doing the same exercise for heavy duty trucking, my community concern for that would be a four. So this is just a quick example of like my personal thought process in a totally different city, right? But maybe some of the similar thoughts that you will be having as we're going through this, um, this quick little exercise that um, Dr. Amy Ramos is gonna walk us through. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to, to her to walk us through um, the, the next exercise. Great, thank you so much. And I think that some of our Spanish speakers are unable to ask questions. So I wanna see, Felipa, I just sent you an unmute request. I would like to see if you can, I'm gonna ping you again, and you should see a request that says you're being asked to unmute. See their hands are waving, but I don't hear any questions and I do not have anything muted. Does anybody else hear a question? No, right? No, I'm unable to hear a question. But Nipa, is there any way um, to type a question in the chat or let us know um, if this is a tablet, a phone or a computer by typing it in the chat? We'll have our team troubleshoot. Um, I know Anna is working with Felipe to try to get a call in and get questions. So as they're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and launch this activity. So um, I'd like for at this moment, anyone who would like to participate, um, add, uh, take out their cell phone. So regardless if you have a flip phone or a smartphone, whatever kind of phone you have, now is the time to bring out your cell phone. We're going to use it. And I see Ana has got a question from Felipa. So we'll, um, we'll wait to see if there's more questions there and I will read them in one second. So if everyone could text AB617 to 37607. When you send that text on your cell phone, you will get an immediate response and it will let you know that you've joined my channel. So it'll let you know that you've joined Amy Ramos's channel and you are ready to participate in this activity. And as you're waiting for that response, um, Anna has um, got a hold of the of uh, Felipa and the team there, and Maribel has texts that, um, well, today there are a lot of cars and I don't think there are a ton of trucks and there is a lot of traffic in general. So this is a concern, another consideration about traffic. So be thinking about how traffic plays a role in how you rank um, each of the SERP uh, measures. This is a great, um, Sharing, thank you so much, Maribel. So everyone on uh, with us today? All right, we're gonna practice. So as- Can I share your screen, Dr. Amy? Yes, I was just about to go. 
As uh, Gabby mentioned, we would like to make sure that you are keeping in mind all these considerations as you uh, prepare for the CSC members to answer the survey about each of the CERT measures. And so we're practicing just with one today so that we can go directly into um, having you all do this on your own with individuals from the Air District that will call you to have a one-on-one -on -one session with you to ensure that if needed, to ensure that you have access to the survey. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And again, we're just going through one example today, just to practice. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with a little warm up activity. So what I would like for you to do is we're gonna practice to make sure that everyone's cell phone is working. I'd like to ask you on a scale of one, not at all to four, always, how frequently do you eat chocolate? One be not at all, two sometimes, three often, four always. This is for fun. Let's see what your chocolate habits are like. So when you submit your answer, you will see the bars change. Oh, so it looks like we don't have any non-chocolate eaters so far. Uh, most of us are consuming some amount of chocolate. Yay, we're all healthy in the cacao world. Um, but what you will also notice now, if you try to answer it again, you will get a signal that says, uh-uh-uh, only one response um, allowed. So if you want to test it out, test the settings, you can try it if you want. If you add another number, it should prompt you that you can no longer answer that question. So very good. All right, so let's go on to the next one. So now I want to know, what's your favorite chocolate? What you're going to do now is in your, using your cell phone, you can just text your favorite chocolate. What is that chocolate? Maybe it's a bonbon, maybe it's dark salt chocolate, ooh, milk chocolate. What else is it? And for this one, because we're trying to source different answers, you can type your answer multiple times. Maybe you like dark chocolate and you like um, milk chocolate, white chocolate. You can type them all in there and they will appear. Ooh, we got some C's lovers, Snickers, caramel, Bordeaux, ooh, spicy chocolate, Reese's Pieces. Where's the peanut butter cups? No one's typing peanut butter cups. Truffles, swanky, I love it. All right, so now we, we all have some practice here, right? So you see how you can answer and you see how you can also uh, provide a text response if that is the prompt. Any questions before we proceed to the actual survey? Any questions on the chat? I see Gus, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yeah, can you... Uh... Like, can you guys verify that everyone participated? I can verify that those that have registered have participated, yes. Okay. And just to clarify, sorry, Gustavo, just I think the survey we're doing right now, Amy, is just a, a kind of an exercise to wrap up this item. This is not the official survey no. um, by any means. It's just sort of a final exercise. Okay. But are we getting some pretty good participation overall? Yes. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, this is just to get you in the mindset because you're gonna go through all those certain measures. Like notice we've been talking about this for 20 minutes and we've gone through one measure. So the ask is going to be to go through all of them and we would like for you to have some practice and exposure to being able to rank each of these measures. So let's go is, ahead and go. Is milk bigger because more people said milk versus? Yes. Okay, that's, that's what right. I, I assumed. Yeah, that's what I love about these word clouds. They get bigger with proportion of responses. So we got a lot of milk chocolate lovers here. Someone said good chocolate. I love that. As long as it's good. Okay, let's go to the next one. So now we're practicing. So this is not the, the, the final prioritization exercise. This is practice for you to get in the groove of how you're gonna answer this for each of the measures. So for the passenger vehicle cert measure, on a scale of one, not at all important, 
to four, very important, how important is proximity as a consideration for you? One, not at all important. Two, low importance. Three, moderately important. Four, very important. Please type your response once. In the same chat on your cell phone, you enter that number that best represents how important proximity is as a consideration. I want to make sure that all of our CSD members have an opportunity to respond. Any questions coming from Bianca, Gustavo, anybody on your end texting you over there? Okay, so now if you look at the data, you see how folks have responded, right? So in terms of Proximity is important. We see a distribution um, in the high importance and some folks saying low importance and some folks saying uh, moderately important. Let's go to the next one. We're gonna do this again. Now, again, this is simply for the passenger vehicle cert measure. How important is complexity as a consideration? And we just defined complexity in our previous conversation. Remember, if you stepped away and are coming back to this conversation, you are texting AB617 to number 37607 to join, and you're able to respond to this question by entering one of the numbers that best represents your responses. All right, so we can see here, if we look at this data and the responses, we see that folks are saying that the passenger vehicle cert measure is ranking um, very important in terms of its complexity. Let's move on to the next factor that should be in your consideration. So for this same measure, how important is emissions reductions as a consideration? How important is emissions reductions as a consideration? On a scale from one to four, one being not at all, to four being very important. There is no five. You're ranking between one to four. Did I put a five in there? No, just teasing. Just I think teasing. Gus is just <laughs> emphasizing how important emissions reductions are. Four plus. All right, so if we look at that data again, very important. Uh, most of you are, 63% of you answered in the very important category. So now let's look at that last factor on community concern. So again, for the passenger vehicle cert measure, how important is community concern as a consideration?
again, community concern ranks pretty high in more in the moderately to very important category. So we've just gone through this exercise together and we've ranked one measure together. Now for CSC members, it'll be um, your responsibility to go through the entire survey and rank each of the measures so that we can have that data available at our fingertips. There obviously could be something that we're missing. So what else is important when considering CERT measures? At this, for this open-ended response, you can type whatever you think is, uh, must be considered so that we can see what those other considerations should be. So go ahead and type your response directly into your cell phone and hit send and it'll pop up right directly in front of us. And just, I saw you unmuted. Would you like to add anything else? That was accidental. Oh, okay. And um, I think just for the sake of time, as folks are entering their responses, I'll share, uh, I'll just kind of recap the next steps that um, we've already briefly shared with you today. So you'll be receiving a survey um, probably by the end of this week. Um, so for some folks that'll be through mail um, and the Air District um, is available also to support um, by phone or some other means if necessary for you to complete the survey. So we just wanna thank you all for participating in this exercise with us today. We hope that you feel better prepared um, to score all of the CERP measures um, so that the CSE can really get started in implementing some of these measures in your community. Um, so yeah, just thank you so much for um, taking the time to participate in this exercise with us. And um, we look forward to um, distributing that survey to support um, the rest of the prioritization. Um, so I think we can leave this open on our end, um, Dr. Amy, so that the responses continue to kick in, but um, I'm going to have to move us along to the next agenda item, um, if that's okay. Um, oh yeah, one more question. If you, if you liked using this technology um, of, you know, the texting polls, let us know. Um, uh, you know, by texting one for yes or two for no, and this just helps us to see if it's something we should um, consider using in the future as a way to really gather your input. All right. Um, we have some standing updates coming, um, coming next. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to um, uh, Min for the DPR update. Hey, good evening, everybody. Hopefully everybody had a great holiday. Um, so 2022, yay. <laughs> um, so just overall, um, not much has changed on our front. I just wanted to let everybody know that for the 1 through D pilot study, we have completed it that year so that it, it's now completed for, for 2021. Uh, my team is going through all the data right now and still waiting for quite a bit of the laboratory analysis that is coming back. So once that becomes available and, and my team is able to dig through it, um, similar to before, I'll, I'll put some updates up for, for this group and kind of talk about what we, what we have been seeing. Um, so in total, I just want to emphasize we had five uh, studies, five fields that we did from our behalf, um, and then three additional ones that we worked with uh, Dow um, as part of a collaborator group and a UC researcher group to, to perform. So i uh, got some really promising stuff that, that you folks have seen uh, previously. Uh, so hopefully the last two fields will be um, similar in that success. So I'm um, really looking forward to seeing what that comes about. Um, outside of that, it's uh, it's the beginning of the year. So everybody's kind of chugging along and trying to get uh, all their ducks in a row coming back from, from holiday and whatnot. So um, that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest event thus far. So I'll kind of open it up if anybody has any specific questions for us, but outside of that, business as usual. Thank you, Min. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and ask um, for Scott from CARB to provide a brief update for us. Actually, hi there, I'm Scott Wall, California Air Resources Board, and we actually have no updates uh, this month, so um, Happy New Year. <laughs> that was very quick. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, and then um, the final update is from the Valley Air District, I believe Brian Dodd. Actually, I'm going to have you, I'm going to sneak Chai in there to do a little oh, quick perfect. update about uh, about air monitoring. We didn't kind of throw that on the agenda. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Jess. Hey, and good evening, everybody, and a happy new year. 
Um, yeah, just a really brief update here. As you all know, we're still um, uh, awaiting Kern County for the uh, Mexican colony uh, location there by the uh, pocket park to get the electrical um, portion in there. So in the meantime, uh, we don't know, they haven't given us a timeline how long that's gonna take. So again, if any of you know any other potential locations in there uh, that we can look into, uh, please uh, please let me know and uh, I'll, I'll put my contact information in this chat a little bit here. Uh, please uh, let me know and we'll we'll try to get that at the, at the same time as well. And you may have already seen it in the emails, um, but we've had some um, equipment issues at the uh, DMV site um, with the PM10 uh, unit that's been out for a few weeks now. Uh, and we actually got a brand new unit that came in last week. And we have one more component that will link it up so that it'll be live on our website. That was just arrived today. So tomorrow, hopefully we'll get that up and running again. Uh, we got a new unit that's just a bit more robust. So it'll um, uh, last a bit longer and then we shouldn't have these issues um, anymore with it. Um, and also the PM25, unfortunately just went out this weekend too. So uh, we just found that and we will tomorrow go and replace it with a new unit. So I get that address. And uh, that's pretty much it for my update. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Chai, can I ask? So one of the things we talked about last meeting, um, in the meantime, until we find the location for the Mexican colony monitor, we've been having the van there. Um, but at the last meeting, we had some great feedback from residents about monitoring on Lairdo closer on the 99 on the east side. So closer to the to the 99. Um, if you're looking at Shafter out to the right of Shafter a little bit. So I know that's something that we've been kind of splitting time on the van. Is that that's correct? Yeah, that's correct. So just starting um, from I think in December that was mentioned. Uh, before that, we were just mainly focusing on um, just around Mexican colony because all the other monitors are up except for that location. Uh, so right now we're alternating whenever we can get to a shafter we'll use a van and we'll alternate between mexican colony and laird of highway and uh, zerka road thank you both um i think this is a space for any other um agency updates so if there's any updates from folks in the city or the county Um, I think uh, Dr. Amy has a brief update as well. Yeah, this update is for CSC members who are participating in the stipend program. We, we have entered a new calendar year. Um, as folks were saying, you know, 2022, here we come. So you will be receiving in the next week or so a, an envelope that has a copy of your new W-9. So we will be asking folks to complete a new tax form with a W-9 so that we can continue to issue you checks in this new year. And we will also... Tiene que ser dos meses. We will also be um, mailing out a direct deposit form. So if CSC members participating in the stipend program would like to receive their stipends via direct deposit into their bank accounts, please complete that form. Um, in that in that envelope, you also have a self-addressed stamped envelope to mail it back to us. We do need to receive the hard copy with the wet signature from you in our inbox. So please stay tuned for that. And we will also be announcing a short um, session where we can help folks complete their W-9 and complete their direct deposit. Please be on the lookout for an announcement from the Air District. That's it on our end. Thank you. Um, with that, I think I can start to uh, wrap us up by sharing um, some of our action items and then also um, sharing more about um, our next agenda setting meeting and our next meeting. So um, I'm just gonna briefly share my screen here. There's not very many action items for us this um, month. Um, the first one is that the current Council of Governments is going to share information on its current area regional goods movement operations, um, also known as CARGO with a K, um, the sustainability study, um, with the CSC for input on phase two of the study plans. So materials will be sent in advance of the CSC meeting session um, when input will be solicited. The next update here is about the Air District sending a survey for all of the SERP measures. So you can expect that by the end of this week. 
Um, and then the final update, which is still being um, translated on here, is related to the stipend program. Um, so for participants, expect to receive your W-9 and a direct deposit form in the mail for the 2022 year. And then the Air District will announce a short session for completing the firms and just to provide some more technical assistance. Um, and those are all of our action items. Now, just to share information about our next meeting. So um, our next agenda setting meeting is has been moved to Tuesday, January 18th um, due to the holidays. So uh, that's when that will be happening. And then our next um, CSC meeting will be happening February 14th at 5 p.m. Um, and so those are all of the wrap up items on my end. Um, Jessica, is there anything, any other wrapping um, comments from you? I was just going to, if I can share um, my screen, just point to, we go over this during the agenda setting, but not, I know that not everyone has availability or capacity to join us at that meeting. So I just wanted to share with folks and remind them that the action items that Gabby just shared that Jem so generously took for us and that our translation team translated live for us are all posted um, the next day on the steering committee page on the steering committee's um, meeting spot. So if you click there and you go to the most recent meeting, you can see the raw version. So basically, essentially the version you just saw. So there's not much filled out because we just post it as we get it. So you can see it immediately the next day. But what we also do on the main page is that before the following meeting, we um, make fill out all the boxes that are associated with each item so then you can go in here and see that um, someone is now assigned responsibility there is a status and an outcome um, and perhaps a public health um, associated concern depending on the item so in case you hadn't gone here and checked it out if you're wondering kind of what the status was from an action item from a previous meeting you can go here and see these month by month um, and see what the status is. Thank you for that. Um, I, I believe the ladies have figured out how to unmute themselves and it's actually time for public, perfect. It's time for public comment. So um, we welcome any comments from the public at this time. Ah, disculpen, este, soy Ana Valle, no podíamos entrar a, a porque no nos podían escuchar, porque no podíamos, no sabíamos cómo quitar el modo silencio pero ya le encontramos ya que la junta va a terminar, pero nos llegaron unos um, folletos. Este, tenemos que entregarlos a todas las personas o hay que empezarlos a repartir ya o qué hacemos, para cuándo es el último día. Ustedes me dejan saber. Great question. I don't know, I saw Jamie perk up. Maybe I can, I can pass it off to Jamie. We actually can't hear you, Jamie. I don't know if you're double muted by chance. Yeah, I was, thank you. Those are advertising the um, change out program where you can take your fireplace and insert uh, a gas device or an electric heater. Um, we'll give you up to $3,000 to do that. You can pass those out to your friends and neighbors and let them know it's a really great program. You will also start to hear some radio spots that we are going to be running in the area to let people know about that program. And we do have Spanish speakers available uh, to answer questions, uh, and you'll hear more about that, uh, that we'll put that in the radio spot um, as well. You can either get um, a gas insert 
or you can get what we call an electric heat pump. Um, and those are the the two options. The electric heat pumps that they're more they're they're not they it's not something that goes in where your fireplace was. It's actually a way to heat your your home a little more efficiently. Um, but you can pass those out. There's no time frame on it. There's no um, you know you don't have to go out and do them tomorrow. Uh, but uh, we would love for you to help us get the word out. And then we also will be coming back to you for additional suggestions just on a variety of outreach strategies. So that's coming as well. And then the way just to kind of bundle everything up, the way that we're going to hopefully help drive what those strategies are is that we'll have results from our survey um, so that we can collectively make decisions at the agenda setting meetings based on those results. So it'll help us know, you know what, our next discussion has to be about charging stations. That's totally our number one next one, because we already talked about the other priorities, perhaps. So that's just sort of to wrap it all up. And just if you run out of flyers, let us know if you want more. We can certainly send you more. Thank you both. Um, and thank you, Felipa, for asking your question. Um, do we have any other comments from the public at this time? Any comments from um, YouTube? All right. I think um, with that, we can wrap up our first CSE meeting of the new year right on time, even though uh, some of our discussions went slightly over. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I hope you have a great rest of your evening, a great rest of your week, and we will see you at our agenda setting meeting in a couple weeks. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you.